Where the Red Fern Grows, the story of two dogs and a boy, by Wilson Rawls. We're on chapter six. Okay. After the terrifying night, the bright morning sun was a welcome sight. I fixed breakfast and soon we were on our way. I tried to get the pups to follow me so as to lighten my load. They would for away, and then sitting down on their rears, they would cry and whimper. Back in the sack they would go, with their heads sticking out of the holes and their long ears flopping. I moved on. About midday I entered country I knew. I wasn't far from home. I dropped down out of the mountains into the bottoms far above the place I had crossed the river on my way to town. Staying on the left of the river, I followed its course past several campgrounds, but didn't stop until I came to the one where I'd found the magazine. Here, I took the pups out of the sack and sat down in the warm sand. As the afternoon wore on, I sat there deep in thought. I was trying to think what I was going to tell my mother and father. I could think of nothing. Finally, I decided I would just tell them the truth, and with the help of the new overalls, cloth, and candy, I would weather the storm. My pups were having a big time playing. With their little front paws locked around each other, they were growling, rolling, and chewing on one another. They looked so cute, I laughed out loud. While I was watching them romping on one another, they looked so cute, I laughed out loud. While I was watching them romping, the thought came, I hadn't named them. I went over the list of names. For him, I tried Red, Bugle, Lead, or Lead. Name after name as before. For her, I tried Susie, Mabel, Queen, all kinds of girl names. None seemed to fit. Still mumbling names over and over, I glanced up. There, carved in the white bark of a sycamore tree, was a large heart. In the center of the heart were two names, Dan and Ann. The name Dan was a little larger than Ann. It was wide and bold. The scars stood out more. The name Ann was small, neat, and even. I stared, unbelieving, for there were my names. They were perfect. I walked over and picked up my pups. Looking at him, I said, your name is Dan. I'll call you Old Dan. Looking at her, I said, Your name is Girl. Your name, Little Girl, is Ann. I'll call you Little Ann. It was then I realized it was all too perfect. Here in this fisherman's cap, I'm sorry, camp, I had found the magazine and the ad. I looked over at the old sycamore log. There I had, there I had asked God to help me get two hound pups. There were the pups rolling and playing in the warm sand. I thought of the old KC baking powder can and the fishermen, how freely they had given their nickels and dimes. I looked up again to the names carved in the tree. Yes, it was all there like a large puzzle, piece by piece, each fit perfectly until the puzzle was complete. It could not have happened without the help of an unseen power. I stayed at the campground until dark. I knew I had to go home, but I put it off as long as I could. The crying of the pups telling me they were hungry made up my mind for me. I knew the time had come for me to face my mother and father. I sacked up my dogs and waited in the river. As I came out of the bottoms, I could see the lamplight glow from the windows of our home. One of the small yellow squares darkened for an instant. Someone had walked across the floor. I wondered who it was. I heard Daisy, our milk cow, moo. I was thinking so hard of what I would say, it startled me for a second. Reaching the gate to our house, I stopped. I had never thought our home very pretty, but that night it looked different. It looked clean and neat and peaceful, nestled there in the foothills of the Ozarks. Yes, on that night, I was proud of our home. My bare feet made no noise as I crossed the porch. With my free hand, I reached and pulled the leather that worked the latch. Slowly, the door swung inward. I couldn't see my father or sisters. There were too f they were too far to the right of me. 
but my mother was directly in front of the door. She was in front of the door sitting in her old cane bottom rocker, knitting. She looked up. I saw all the worry and grief leave her eyes. Her head bowed down. The knitting in her hands came over to cover her face. I stepped inside the room. I wanted to run to her and comfort her and tell her how sorry I was for all the worry and grief I'd caused her. The booming voice of my father shook me from my trance. He said, well, what have you got there? Laughing, he got up from his chair and came over to me. He reached and took the sack from my shoulder. When we started looking for you, he said, I went to the store with your grand and your grandpa told me all about it. It wasn't too hard to figure out what you had done, but you should have told us. I ran to my mother and dropped to my knees. I buried my face in her lap. As Mama patted my head, I heard her say in a quivering voice, Oh, why didn't you tell us? Why? I couldn't answer. Between sobs, I heard the squeals of delight from my sisters as they fondled my pups. I heard my father say, What's this other stuff got? What's this other stuff you've got? Without raising my head from my mother's lap, in a choking voice, I said, Oh, oh, one is for you, one is for Mama, and the other is for the girls. I heard one of the snapping of string. I heard the snapping of string and the rattle of paper. The oohs and ahs from my sisters were wonderful to hear. Papa came over to Mama, laying the cloth on the arm of her chair. He said, well, you've been wanting a new dress. Here's enough cloth to make half a dozen dresses. Realizing that everything was forgiven, I stood up and dried my eyes. Papa was pleased with his new overalls. My sisters forgot the pups for the candy. The light that was shining from my mother's eyes as she fingered the cheap cotton cloth was something I will never forget. Mama warmed some milk for the pups. They drank until their little tummies were tight and round. As I ate, Papa sat down at the table and started talking man talk with t to me. He asked, how are things in town? I told him it was boiling with people. The wagon yard was full of wagons and teams. He asked if I'd seen anyone I knew. I told him I hadn't, but the station master had asked about him. He asked me where I spent the night. I told him about the cave in the Sparrowhawk Mountains. He said that must have been the one called Robber's Cave. My youngest sister piped up. Did you stay all night with some robbers? My oldest sister said, silly, that was a long time ago. There aren't any robbers there now. The other one put her nickels worth in. Weren't you scared? No, I said. I wasn't scared of staying in the cave, but I heard a mountain lion scream, and it scared me half to death. Oh, they won't bother you, Papa said. You had a fire, didn't you? I said, yes. He said, they never bother you unless they're wounded or cornered. But if they are, you had better look out. Papa asked me how I liked town. I said I didn't like it at all and wouldn't live there even if they gave it to me. With a querying look on his face, he said, I'm afraid I don't understand. I thought you always wanted to go to town. I did, I said, but I don't anymore. I don't like the people there and couldn't understand them. What was wrong with them, he asked. I told him how they had stared at me and how even and had even laughed and made fun at me of me he said oh i don't think they were making fun of you were they yes they were i said and to beat it all the boys jumped on me and knocked me down in the dirt if it hadn't been for the marshal i would have been taken i would have taken a beating papa said oh so you met the marshal what did you think of him i told him he was a nice man he had bought me a bottle of soda pop at the mention of soda pop, the blue eyes of my sisters opened wide. They started firing questions at me, wanting to know what color it was and what it tasted like. I told them it was strawberry, and it bubbled and tickled me when I drank it, and it made me burp. The eager questions of my three little sisters had an effect on my father and mother. Papa said, Billy, I don't want you to feel badly about the people in town. I don't think they were poking fun at you. Anyway, not like you think they were. Maybe they weren't, I said, but I still didn't want to ever live in town. It's too crowded, and you couldn't get a breath of fresh air. In a sober voice, my father said, 
Someday, you may have to live in town. Your mother and I don't intend to live in these hills all of our lives. It's no place to raise a family. A man's children should have an education. They should get out and see the world and meet people. I don't see why we have to move to town to get an education, I said. Hasn't Mama taught us how to read and write? There's more to an education than just reading and writing, Papa said. Much more. I asked him when he thought we'd be moving to town. Well, it'll be some time yet, he said. We don't have the money now, but I'm hoping someday we will. From the stove where we were heating salt water for my feet, where she was heating salt water for my feet, Mama said in a low voice, I'll pray every day and night for that day to come. I don't want you children to grow up without an education, not even knowing what a bottle of soda cap is or ever seeing the inside of a schoolroom. I don't think I could stand that. I'll just keep praying and someday the good Lord may answer my prayer. I told my mother I'd seen the schoolhouse in town. Again, I had to answer a thousand questions for my sisters. I told them it was made of red brick and was bigger than Grandpa's store, a lot bigger. There must have been at least a thousand kids going to school there. I told all about the teeter-totters, the swings made out of log chains, the funny-looking pipe that ran up the side of the building, and how I had to climb up in it and slide out like the other kids. I didn't tell them how I came out. I think that was a fire escape, Papa said. Fire escape, I said. It looked like a slide to me. Didn't you notice where it made that bend up at the top, he asked. I nodded my head. Well, inside the school, there's a door, he said. If the school gets on fire, they open the door, the children jump in the pipe and slide out to safety. Boy, that's a keen way of getting out of a fire, I said. Well, it's getting late, Papa said. We'll talk about this some other time. We'd better get to bed as we have lots of work to do tomorrow. My pups were put in the corn crib for the night. I covered them with shucks and kissed them good night. The next day was a busy one for me. With the hampering help of my sisters, I made the little dog house. Papa cut the ends off his, che off his check lines and gave them to me for collars. With painstaking care, deep in the tough leather, I scratched the name, Old Dan, and in one, and Little Ann on the other. With a nail and a rock, two holes were punched in each end of, a, of the strap. I put them around their small necks and laced the ends together with bailing wire. That evening, I had to talk with my mother. I had a talk with my mother. I told her about praying for the two pups, about the magazine and the plans I had made. I told her how hard I tried to find names for them and how strange it was finding them carved in the bark of a sycamore tree. With a smile on her face, she asked, Do you believe God heard your prayers and helped you? Yes, Mama, I said. I know he did, and I'll always be thankful. The end of chapter 6